Listen now to these words that come from the Gospel of Luke. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we thank you for this day that you have given us for the rain that has kissed your earth. And above all, O oh God, for the presence that we find of you in one another and the friendships that you grant us this day. So despite the overcast of this gray day, let the bright sun of your hope revive us once again upon hearing your word and how it might heal us just a little bit more this very day. Amen. You may not realize this, but today you are part of a religious experiment. Today we in the church, we the supposed followers of Jesus are the subjects of a religious experiment. And that experiment asks a simple question. Did you give thanks? Did you give thanks? When we woke up this morning, when we had that first cup of coffee, when we were given that pause, perhaps, at a traffic light, when we walked into this new church space with its new paint smell, did we give thanks? Because it would appear that from today's scripture reading, that is the ultimate mark of discipleship, of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving, gratitude. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this morning, when some of us drove into the new church parking lot or the old church parking lot, either way, perhaps not having to park on the grass for a change. And we walked up one of the new sidewalks maybe and you saw the evolving landscape with sage and new trees and grass and mulch all around, a little bit damp, yes, but did we say, wow, thank you, God. When we washed our hands in one of the new bathrooms and we looked around and witnessed the interior decorating bedazzlement of Kevin and Jess. <laughs> or when we made our way into the sanctuary, perhaps receiving a worship bulletin from Linda Coates and maybe even getting a hug from her. And then when we sat down in one of these new sanctuary chairs and we looked up at this expanded space that has been years in the making, did we whisper? Thank you, God. This puts it in perspective for me. So the other day, I brought lunch to my friend Kimmy Daly over at A&M Consolidated High School. She's also the part-time pastor at Christ Holy Missionary Baptist Church. And she said, I want Lane's chicken fingers. I said, okay. So I picked up lunch for her and for two other co-workers, another couple of box lunches. And when I walked in the door, Trey of drinks and lunches in hand. She took one look at me, Kimmy, and she said, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I thought, uh, okay, this is just uh, Lane's chicken fingers. <laughs> but thank you, Jesus. Maybe at that point, Jesus would have said, 
were not three given Lane's chicken fingers <laughs> for lunch and one a vegetarian option four lunches in all but the other three where are they was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner now pastor Kimmy Daly is no foreigner in this context but the Samaritan in today's scripture certainly is and his outsider nature seems to be emphasized for a reason the scripture reads then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, period. And he was a Samaritan. One of the things God's people wrestled with in that day was how to relate to the Jewish roots of their faith and what they should do about all these Gentiles coming into their churches. They were working out the problem of who they were. And Luke's gospel was written in a, as a lesson from the outsiders to the insiders in order to eliminate that binary notion of us and them all together. And for people of faith today who read this text, let us acknowledge that quite often it's the ones who are shunned and marginalized. It's the ones who are stereotyped and dehumanized and thereby thrown out of the inner circle who turn back and teach us the most powerful lessons. I love the Chris Nolan Batman movies and the second one of the trilogy is The Dark Knight. It's all always going to be remembered by that epic performance from Heath Ledger as the Joker. And in this climactic scene in the movie there are two boats that carry people from one end of Gotham to the other. And on these two boats, the Joker has put a hundred gallons of, explosive, of explosives rigged to blow on both of the boats. All the people get on them, and then they find a detonator on the boat when it is shipped off. And it's at that point that the voice of the Joker comes on the loudspeaker, and he says, Tonight, you will all be a part of a social experiment. There are explosives on your boat. They are rigged to blow, and I can blow you all sky high with the press of a button. And if any of you tries to jump off the boat, I will do just that. At midnight, I'm going to do that anyway. But you've got a detonator. It's for the other boat's explosives. If you press it, if you choose to press it and blow up the other boat, I will spare your boat. So think about it, but don't think too long because the people on the other boat might not be quite so noble as you are. One boat that's full of innocent civilians and they take a vote and they decide that they're going to use their detonator device. But then when one person gets up to actually push that button, he can't do it. He shoves it aside, sits down, and they all hang their heads in shame. Meanwhile, the other boat is full of Gotham's worst, worst folk. Gotham's most wanted, convicted felons, all clad in orange jumps, jumpsuits. They're being transported to a prison facility. The warden has the detonator, and he's looking sorely tempted to press it, but he's quivering with inner conflict. You can tell that he wants to do it, but he needs someone else to have that shame on their hands. And that's when one of the prisoners stands up. This guy's huge. Tattoos on his arms, lazy eye, mean look on his face. This guy looks like a real scumbag, you know? But in this moment, the guards keep their shotguns restrained and they let this prisoner approach the warden. This menace to society towers over the warden. And he says, give it to me. You can tell him that I took it by force. Give it to me and I'll do what you should have did. Ten minutes ago. Warden looks at the ground, hands the detonator to the inmate, and the inmate throws it out the window. Give it to me, and I'll do what you should have done, says the outsider. He foiled the Joker's social experiment, but he reminded the powers that be of their core virtues and how important those virtues are. Give it to me, and I'll do what you should have done. So I think he passed 
the religious experiment. The Samaritan turns back and reminds us of the core virtues of thanksgiving and gratitude, and Jesus confirms how important those virtues are when he says to the outsider, your faith has made you well. But there's something more going on here than just a lesson about saying thank you. Jesus heals 10 people of leprosy, and he does it by saying to them from a distance, go and show yourselves to the priests. And they set out to do just that, to show themselves to the priests, and as they're walking, their leprosy dis disappears. Why does Jesus tell them to go to the priests? Being lepers made them outcasts from society. That was a religious law. It was one thing to be cleansed of their leprosy, yes. But if they showed themselves to the priests, then they could finally be fully cleansed by being given that religious right to re-enter society. No more hollering at people from a distance. If you're a Jew, that is. A Samaritan could be cleansed of his leprosy, but he couldn't be cleansed of being a Samaritan. The priests weren't going to give him the blessing to fully participate in society, no matter how clean he was. He was an outcast. So what if the story were different? What if the nine had turned back to thank Jesus instead of going on to the priests? What if the newly cleansed nine had set aside that power and privilege that were waiting for them by religious right and instead turned back to join the outsider at the feet of Jesus? The story is not just about the virtues of thanksgiving and gratitude. It's about how those virtues have the power to heal us, to truly heal us. It's about how they can make us new. And this morning, I want to share with us that this story has the power to heal the church. A couple of years ago, I conducted a series of conversational interviews in our community with people who were not members of our congregation and who identified as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer. And the topic of the interviews was hospitality, specifically church hospitality. One of the interviewees was Lily. 28-year-old woman who identified as queer. I asked Lily, in your opinion, how can we at Friends Congregational Church improve as a church? And Lily said, don't be the one who is there to maintain the status quo. Don't be the one who just maintains the mainstream social power, whatever it is. Don't be the one who actually fosters people using those power structures. Friends Congregational Church, let's be reminded this morning that for ages, the church has boasted religious authority by saying, this is the place where you can come to be cleansed of your sins by the power of God in Christ Jesus. Being cleansed is good. But over the ages, the church has also said, you can be cleansed of your sins but you're still going to be a woman. You won't be fully cleansed in that respect. You're still going to be an interracial couple. You're still going to be disabled. You're still going to be poor. You're still going to be gay. So you can be cleansed and you can sit there, but you can never fully participate in the life of the church. It sounds like the squeaky clean church needs to be healed. And here is where the religious experiment comes in for us. The religious experiment is this. God has delivered us into this space. Did you hear the psalm at the beginning of the service? God has delivered us into this space. We went through fire and through water, yet you, O oh God, have brought us out to a spacious place. God has delivered us into this spacious place, just as Jesus delivered the lepers into being cleansed. One leper returned to Jesus, and Jesus' response to him was, your faith has made you well. Another version of the text says, your faith has healed you and saved you. Now, will we return to God to give thanks for being delivered into this spacious place? And if so, how are we going to do that? Beloved community, we express gratitude. We return to God and give thanks by first acknowledging our own need 
to be not just cleansed, but to be fully healed, fully healed of prejudices and fears and barriers that this world instills in us. As the actors in chilling fashion said in unison last night at the performance of the Laramie Project, we are all like this. We need to be fully healed from our greed and our resentments, fully healed from our apathy and fear, fully healed from our jealousies and hatred, fully healed from our misogyny and homophobia, our racism and transphobia, our lust for war and our justifications for violence. We need to be fully healed from any divisions that this world tempts us to place between ourselves and our neighbor because those barriers, those divisions are sin. Those divisions between ourselves and our neighbor are barriers between ourselves and the God who delivers us into spacious places. We can keep on traipsing toward the easy, comfortable, squeaky, clean power and privilege that are given to us by religious right and religious authority. Or we can turn back and say thank you by welcoming God's healing into our lives of faith. That begins by listening to the Samaritans in our midst. Lily said something else in that interview. She told me, one of the major themes of the Bible is to love other people. She said, if a church is being unwelcoming to people who are different and putting this into a social context, these people are also being discriminated against in society, and the church doesn't provide support that these people cannot get from anywhere else, that's not love. It's not love if you exclude people who are different. So from my definition, Lily said, that would not be a true church. The Samaritans in our midst have a way of reminding us of what is important. This church for the last several weeks has been swarming with outsiders. What I mean by that are folk who aren't typically going to be sitting in our chairs on a Sunday morning, at least not all of them. I'm talking about the women and men who've been building this space for months now. Construction workers, electricians, painters, AC repair people. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Last week was my first week working out of the new church office, and the outsiders were here all day doing finishing touches. Some of them, in their own way, opened my eyes to parts of this spacious place that we might take for granted. We had a table in the hallway right over here and it said items to be thrown out please take and on Tuesday a construction worker was looking at that table and he found a paddle game he picked it up but instead of taking it he looked for me he sought me out so that he could ask me if he could take it and he, if he could give me some money for it and I said please it's yours please 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 take it <laughs> and he put his wallet back in his pocket and he said thank you my daughter's going to love it I said, how old is your daughter? He said, she's three years old. She's going to love this. Thank you. And then he went back to work acting like he just won a million dollars. And then you talk about relying on the strength of God. There was a scaffold here just a couple of days ago. And on top of that scaffold, which reached to probably the top of this window, there were a couple of guys holding a ladder that went all the way up to the top of that light fixture, which obviously is still being worked on. And the guy that's holding this ladder at the top of the scaffold, at the base of the ladder, he looks up at his buddy who's all the way at the top. And when he looks up at him, he goes like this. <laughs> Makes the sign of the cross. But the biggest reminder that I got the biggest lesson I got this week from one of the outsiders in our midst came when I was in my office organizing some books, obsessing about that. One of the guys who'd been working up in the ceiling on who knows what was standing in my doorway, and he wanted to tell someone about the progress of his particular job, so he thought he'd be the per that I'd be the person to tell. It's hot up in that crawl space, so he was sweating through his clothes, his shirt was unbuttoned to about right here. And I noticed that he had a tattoo that appeared to go all the way around to his back. It was the wreath of a rose bush. And so when he was about to say, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow, I said, I like your tattoo. Tell me about it. And he said that his wife of 24 years had died just last year. 
and he got the tattoo because the rose bush reminded him of the grief that he felt. He told me that he was still struggling with that grief, but he didn't know what to do with it. He said, I'm a person of faith, but I have to tell you, this has caused me to ask some questions. But he said, you're not supposed to ask God why, right? The new office was having its first pastoral care appointment. <laughs> and finally he said, sorry, I just don't get the chance to talk about this stuff ever. Family and friends tell me I'm depressing when I talk about it, so I just keep it a distance. And I said, well, I don't know you nearly as well as they do, but I've enjoyed talking with you. And he said, yeah, that's because you're not judgmental. Am I not judgmental? Are we not judgmental? Is the church not judgmental? Is this spacious place not judgmental? I thank God that I could be non-judgmental in that moment because my encounter with the unlikely outsider in my office healed me from obsessing over the organization of books and the location of chairs for a moment so that I could focus on what is most important about this spacious place. I thank God that I was healed just a little bit in that moment so that the stranger in my midst could be healed just a little bit right along with me. And I pray that in the weeks coming up that all of us would keep on being healed in this place so that God can keep on working miracles in this spacious place and through this spacious place. As Maya Angelou says, as soon as healing takes place, go out and heal somebody else. That's the religious experiment. And it all starts with a little gratitude. Remember the inmate on that boat in the Batman movie. He looks at a detonator that has the potential to destroy lives and he transforms it into a device for healing by saying to the warden, give it to me and I'll do what you should have done. And he throws that accursed thing out the window. Beloved community, perhaps Jesus Christ is looking at this spacious place this morning. Jesus is looking at this church this morning and saying through Samaritan voices, give it to me. And I'll show you what you should do. Perhaps Jesus Christ is looking at our very lives this morning because the people are who make up the church. Looking at our very lives this morning and saying, give it to me. Give it to me. And I'll show you what you should do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Let our healing begin. Amen.